Mr. Martinez. Good morning again. This is not a case of who done it. The person who done it, the person who committed this killing, sits in court today. It's the defendant, Jody Ann Arias. And the person that she done it to is an individual by the name of Travis Victor Alexander, a former boyfriend of hers, an individual that she was in love with, an individual that was a good man, an individual that was one of the greatest blessings in her life. And this love, well, she rewarded that love for Travis Victor Alexander by sticking a knife in his chest. And you know, he was a good man, according to her. And with regard to being a good man, well, she slit his throat as a reward for being a good man. And in terms of these blessings, well, she knocked the blessings out of him by putting a bullet in his head during one event that occurred on June 4th of 2008. Travis Alexander had the misfortune of meeting up with the defendant in Las Vegas, Nevada at the MGM Grand back in September of 2006. They were both involved with a group called PPL, or Prepaid Legal. And basically what this organization did is they went out and they sold units, if you will. And basically it was a situation where people would buy these units and they would be covered for legal purposes should the need arise. And they met, as I said, in September of 2006. And after the meeting, it is true that Mr. Alexander began to have contact with the defendant. And he began sort of to pursue her. But it is also true, or an indication anyway, that initially he was mostly interested in converting her to the Mormon faith. You see, he was a Mormon. He had, he had also been a Mormon for some time. And one of the few first things that he did when he began to talk to her initially is that he gave her the Book of Mormon. And a lot of the time that they had was spent on reading this Book of Mormon, talking about it. And so that their religious relationship progressed to a point, and it was a very rapid religious relationship, that it progressed to the point that in November, approximately two months later, in November of 2006, the defendant chose to become a Mormon. And she, the process that you undergo to do that is you become baptized. And so she was baptized in November of 2006, and the person that she chose to baptize her was none other than Travis Alexander, the person that she had met up with, the person who had introduced her to this faith, and the person that she was beginning to get closer with. And so their relationship progressed after that point, and it became a much more personal relationship. Now they were both Mormons, and there are certain guidelines for Mormons that you'll hear about. Specifically, one of them is that there's not to be any sexual contact before marriage. That's considered a very large sin. In the, I guess in the grand scheme of things, that's, that's one of the sins that you need to avoid. But their relationship began to progress, and it was a, a very personal relationship. At that time, as their relationship progressed, the defendant was not living in the Arizona area. In fact, she lived in the Palm Spring area uh, of California. And so it was sort of like a long distance relationship. They would call each other, they would send text messages, they would email each other. And so their relationship blossomed that way and occasionally they would see each other. They would either, they, he would drive out there or they would somehow meet. Well, by February of 2007, um, they became sort of an item. They agreed to just continue dating each other, just to see each other and not anybody else. And as part of that, one of the things that happened is that they both did what is not expected, but what usually can be expected to happen between two young people. They began to engage in sexual relations. And obviously, that is against the Mormon faith. And it provided conflict for both of them, that here they were sinning, if you will, all the time, whenever they would get together. And yet, 
professing to be good Mormons on the other hand. But that's sort of how their relationship was at that point. Well, they continued this relationship for about five months, from, from February 2007 to about June of uh, 2007. And in June, to be exact, using her uh, telling, June 29th of 2007, the defendant couldn't help herself. She was a snoop, just couldn't help herself. And what she did is she went and looked into, got a hold of Mr. Alexander's phone, his cellular telephone, and she wanted to see what was in there. Couldn't stop herself from doing that, and so she goes and look at it, looks at his cell phone in June of 2007. And she's looking for things to see whether or not there's going to be any contact with any other women. She describes them as being flirtatious, and she wanted to know what was going on and wanted to see if there was anything in that cell phone that would confirm her suspicions about his flirtations. And she found things there that she didn't like. And, but it was her going into his cell phone snooping. She did it surreptitiously. She did it without his knowledge because she wanted to know. She just couldn't help herself. And so she looks in there and finds things that she doesn't like. And at that point, they break up. That's June 29th of 2007. And remember, at that time, she's still living in Southern California in the Palm Spring area. After they broke up, you would expect that perhaps the emails would end, you would expect that perhaps the text messages would end, and maybe that the calls would attend you. But just the opposite happens. Because instead of staying there in Southern California, or perhaps moving to where she was originally from, which is Wairica, California, which is on the Oregon-California border, instead of going there after this breakup in June of 2007, what does the defendant do? She moves to Mesa. She moves to Mesa. She, she can be closer to him. This individual that she does not trust, this individual whose phone she's gone and looked into, and this individual who she's just broken up, what does she do? Let's go to Mesa. Not only does she move to Mesa, but she moves to an area that's very close to his. And she is not in the same ward, but she does move to an area that's very close to where he is. And of course, the relationship continues. They continue to talk. They continue to text message each other. They continue the emails. And oh yes, they continue the sexual liaisons because she moved here. Well, this continues on for some time. But Mr. Alexander, by this point, appears to be ready to move on. Or at least he appears to be ready to date other people. And in fact, he starts dating somebody by the name of Lisa Andrews. And there may have been others that he started to date. But at that point, there was no relationship between him and the defendant other than this constant contact and this sexual relationship between the two. This relationship that was facilitated, this sexual relationship that was facilitated by her move to the Mesa area. Well, this continues for some time until April of 2008. So in June of 2007, she moves here. And we fast forward to April of 2008, when finally the relationship seems to have run its course. It seems to have run its course because the defendant has finally decided to move to where her hometown is, a small town by the name of Wairica, California. Uh, and again, it's about a 1,000 miles away from Mesa. And what she does before she leaves is she spends about a week with uh, Mr. Alexander. And yes, according to her, they do have sexual intercourse. They continue that course of conduct. And she rents a U-Haul. And there's an agreement with, between the two of them involving Mr. Uh, Alexander's automobile, a BMW. And basically, he gives it to her, but not really giving, in the sense that she has to pay him. And she has to pay him an undetermined amount of money per month for this BMW that is his. He actually then buys a Prius, a black Prius. And so in early April of 2008, she loads up that U-Haul. Her mother may have come out here, but left before that. And then straps the 
BMW behind it. Doesn't get very far before there's a problem. The BMW starts leaking oil and all these kinds of things because she left it in first gear and cannot be towed. So now the BMW is destroyed and it goes to some sort of shop. But she leaves it, but she's still basically going to pay for that BMW because she's the individual that was in control of it. But that's still sort of up in the air about that. Well, you would have thought that once she moved to Wairika, which is approximately a thousand miles away, you would have thought that their relationship would have been over. No, it wasn't over. They continued to talk. They continued to um, send text messages, emails, instant messaging, messaging. And oh yes, there's the phone sex that she records of them when they are engaged in that particular conduct. And it's the phone sex that she keeps. Well, two short months after that April of 2008, when she moved to Wairika in June, June 9th of 2008, the police get a 911 call. The Mesa Police Department receives a 911 call. And the person on calling on the other line is an individual by the name of Marie Hall. And Marie Hall is an individual that Mr. Alexander has taken an interest in. She is somebody that is very much in the faith. She's somebody that is in his singles ward so that they go and they sit around and they socialize and they talk about the Mormon doctrine. And so she's somebody that he feels much affinity to and he starts to court her. And again, this is when the defendant is already in Wairika. He begins to look at her and the relationship with Lisa Andrews is now over. And so he begins to take her out. There's a total of three dates that they go on. But for her, there's really no spark there. She's not interested in the slightest in him. Not only is she not interested in the slightest in him, she lets him know about it. It's not like she's going to sit there and just continue to go out with him and hang out and that sort of thing. No, they go out one time, they go back to a bookstore and they drink hot chocolate. There's no contact at all. There's not even the, sometimes what is considered the obligatory goodnight kiss. There's none of that. And she lets him know. I'm just not interested in you. And in fact, she starts to date somebody else. After she breaks up with that person, Mr. Alexander feels that perhaps there's a chance with him. And so they go out one more time, and they go to a, uh, a, a crafts kind of thing where they put a pot together, that kind of thing. Or they go rock climbing. That's the extent of their dating relationship. He's interested, she is not, but there's never any physical contact. Mr. Alexander has is a free trip to Cancun. This organization, this prepaid legal that he's involved in has given him, along with other people with, with the PPL, um, a trip to Cancun. And he's allowed to take somebody with him. And so he approaches this Marie or Mimi Hall about going with him to Cancun. She says, no, I really don't want to go because I don't want you to believe that there's something going on between us. I, I really don't want to go there. But he tells her that that's not how it is. They're going to go as friends. In fact, they're even going to be in different bedrooms. So it's a situation where she's been to Cancun before. She wants to go. It was fun. So she doesn't see any harm in going. And so the trip that they're supposed to go on is supposed to start on the 10th of June. And so she's the one that's on the phone on June 9th. And she hasn't spoken to Mr. Alexander for about a week since June 2nd, which is a Monday. And it's strange to her because the trip is impending, and he usually would call her every day or send text messages or maybe email her. So it was strange that he hadn't called her, but she really didn't think anything of it. You know, since they were only going to go as friends, what's the big deal, right? And so, when she doesn't hear from him up until the night before they're to go, which is the ninth, which is a Tuesday, well, a Monday, one of the things she does is she goes over on that Monday night. And when she goes over there, she goes and knocks on the door. And she knocks on the door very, very hard. Well, nobody answers. 
The only thing that she sees is the dog. The dog Napoleon, which is Mr. Alexander's dog, comes up to the door, just sort of throwing himself up on the door very excitedly. And she can tell that there's something wrong here. But nobody answers the door, and she doesn't know how to get in. Now there's four of them. There's Mimi Hall, her girlfriend, and these two other individuals, two men. They open the door, and when they open the door, Marie Hall stays behind, and the two men go inside. But she's able to see through the crack all this blood that's in the hallway. And the two individuals come out running excitedly and say, there's blood here, and that's Travis. He's in the shower. He's dead. And that's the, the reason that Marie Hall was on the telephone that evening of June 9, 2008, calling the police to let them know that the person that she was going to go to Cancun with the next day, this friend of hers from the church, Travis Alexander, was dead. Well, of course, the police responded. And one of the things that they were able to know, and I do have a uh, diagram so that maybe you can follow closer what I'm saying. I told you that, and this is exhibit number 249. I told you that Marie Hall and her friends went to this door, and this is the door. As you can see there, looking there, that's a big red spot. And there was lots of blood that you could also see here. And of course, the body is found on the lower right-hand corner in the shower. It wasn't standing, it wasn't anything, it was all just sort of hunched in. And one of the things that struck the investigators when they first went in there and they started looking at this is that the scene had been staged. It had been manipulate, manipulated. Whoever had been the killer of this scene had manipulated that scene. And the police knew that that scene had been manipulated, first of all, by where the body was found. The body was found inside the shower, and the killing had obviously taken place somewhere else because there was blood all around the bottom here, the southern port part. Right there on the sink, it is clear that the victim had stood over that and bled. And in fact, down here, it was also clear that he had bled there, and there were some drag marks down that hallway. So somebody had taken the time to manipulate, stage, change the appearance of the scene by placing the body there. The other thing that was notable about the staging of the scene was that who had ever had done this killing had also taken the time to wash the body down. And it appeared that the person who had done this actually washed the body down with this big cup, had taken it and had poured it all over the body so that basically there was almost no blood on the body. It was just bloated from decomposition. But the area here, the cut that they, they were subsequently going to see, there was no real blood anywhere. So it was clear that somebody had cleaned him up such that whatever evidence was there is not going to be there anymore because the body had been washed. The other thing that they noted was that if this body is in such a bad condition, there was no knife there, and it appeared there were cuts, and it appears there was a shot, and the gun wasn't there either. So somebody had also removed those from the scene, had taken the time, had thought this out enough to say, I'm going to take the gun, and I'm going to take the knife away. Additionally, what this person had done was that they had taken, possibly, and it's consistent with the glass, had taken the glass and had just poured water down the hallway, down this area, because boxes that were on the ground level in this closet area here were actually soaked in water and blood. And additionally, what they were able to see was that down here, this big, large, massive blood with a 45 on there, well, that also had a lot of water in it. That was diluted blood. Somebody had taken the time to actually try to clean that. Not only that, the items had been moved. For example, there was a scale. And the scale underneath it had drops of blood that somebody had. Somehow the blood had gotten there. The scale had been turned over. The mat, the same thing. There was blood underneath. So somebody had taken a considerable amount of time, 
however much time that would be, to stage that part of the scene. But they weren't through with that part of the staging of the scene. Because what they ended up doing is they took, and there was a matching set of towels there. What they did is they took one of the towels and began to wipe the area there. We don't know exactly what area it was wiped down, but the towel is red and has this reddish substance to it. Not only did they wipe it down with that towel, but they took all of the bedding from this king size bed and they took that along with this towel and walked it downstairs to that washer as you walk in and stuck it in there. And what was also noted, notable for the police in terms of what was staged and what was manipulated was that here in this closet and in this bedroom where the bed was, that had not been manipulated. In other, in other words, there was no blood there, but it, the, the, the covers had been taken, anything that was on there had been taken and placed into that washing machine. There were also some of the victim's clothing that was in that washing machine. And also, interestingly enough, in that washing machine downstairs was a camera. And this camera, unfortunately, had been put through the wash. And as you, everybody that's familiar with the washing, that's not a very gentle sort of process. And the camera was destroyed. It was all messed up. It would never take any pictures again. So that's what one of the things that confronted or that the police were able to see. The other thing that they were able to find came from the body, things that uh, they needed to know. And one of the things that they noted from that was that this was a very violent attack that took some time. The reason that it was a very violent attack is that there were three ways that he was killed. It wasn't just one shot, it was more than that. And what the medical examiner was able to find was, his name's Kevin Horn, was that there was a stab to the heart area that was not immediately or rapidly fatal. And what that means is he's stabbed and he still lives. He still can walk, he can still stand, he can still grab, he can still speak. That's not immediately fatal and it's not rapidly fatal. The other thing that the medical examiner found, but it would kill him, this stab to the heart. The other thing that the medical examiner found was that his throat was slit from ear to ear. And that one was rapidly fatal, which means it would have killed him very quickly because of the blood loss. Not only would it have killed him very quickly, but he would not have gained or, or, or had consciousness for a very long period of time. He would have almost immediately have lapsed into unconsciousness. So the one to the throat. Well, and the one to the head, well, again, since that involved the brain and although the body was decomposed, according to the medical examiner, that one was also rapidly fatal. And additionally, he would lose consciousness immediately. Based on that, and based on the fact that Mr. Alexander in his hands had what the medical examiner is going to term as defensive wounds. In other words, Mr. Alexander did not die calmly. He fought. Whoever this person was that had killed him, he had fought, which meant that he was conscious at the time. So what that meant is that with regard to the injuries that were inflicted, according to the medical examiner, the first injury was the one to the heart. And when that was inflicted, Mr. Alexander at some point began to fight and what he was able to do was grab the knife, but he grabbed the blade of the knife so that he has cuts in his hand as he's fighting, presumably for his life. They're called defensive wounds. And given that there was blood over the sink that we have over here, and that the sink is waist level, and that blood is coming down from a source, Mr. Alexander was able to get up from where he was standing at this point, go over to the sink, stand there, and bleed. But those aren't the only wounds that he had. He had a grouping of wounds back here behind his neck, on his shoulders. He had some on his head. He had some on his ears. He had some here, too. And, and by here, I mean his front torso area. So the first hit, if you will, was to the heart area. And he was walking around. 
He was grabbing the knife. He was trying to defend himself, and that's why they call him defensive wounds. Given the blood spatter pattern, he ended up over here where the 45 was. And he, when he ended up there, that's when his throat was slit. And he was still alive, and he, we know that because of the amount of blood that was there. So whoever had done it basically followed him around, gone to that where that 45 is, went to finish him off and cut his throat. But they weren't through with him. What they did is, this individual then, killer, dragged him this way towards the area of the sink. And in that area of the sink, where that number one is, right in that general area, and according to the medical examiner, by that time, he was probably most likely dead, finished the job as if it needed to be finished. Because the first one, even though it wasn't rapidly fatal, was going to be fatal. The second one, for sure, was totally fatal. The third one, well, took a shot, stuck it in his temple, and the, the body was, at that point, more likely than not dead. So Mr. Alexander that probably didn't feel that one. What we do know, and you'll see, is that there's a number one here. One of the things that was there was a 25 caliber casing which means that the gun that was used was a 25 caliber. Even though police were not able to recover the gun, they know that it was a 25 caliber handgun. So that's what they have in this particular area. But you can have all of that. You now know that it was Mr. Alexander. You now know how he died. But you really don't know the time. You haven't narrowed that down. And Quite frankly, you don't know the identity, one of the most important things, of the person who may have done this. And so police were kind of left there to guess. And you can lift all of the fingerprints you want in the world, but if you don't have anybody to compare that to, you're not going to know who the person was. And you can get all of the blood and DNA samples that you want, saliva, any biological substance that you want, but if you don't have it to compare it to a known sample, that really doesn't get you any nearer to solving this crime to find out who the person was that had actually killed this individual. Well, the police then went down to downstairs and they found this camera. And as I told you, this camera was destroyed. But one of the things that they were able to do is they were able to take out a very small item. It's a SIM card, which is really the brain of the camera. And this camera had been recently purchased by Mr. Alexander. He had bought it between April of 2008 and his killing. Because according to the defendant, she actually advised him via the phone while he was making this purchase of this camera so that he would get a really good camera. Well, this really good camera was in the washer. It was destroyed. It wasn't going to take any pictures anymore. So the police really seem to have nothing except the SIM card. And the SIM card has gotten wet. It has gone through the cycle. And so what ends up happening? Just put that down. You can just put that down. What ends up happening is that they get this SIM card. And with this SIM card, they are able to find. And they, you're going to use here the term end case. They're able to put it through this process so that even though not only has it been damaged, but in this, this camera, somebody has gone through and erased everything. So that not only is the camera damaged physically, but the person who had it last, whoever that may be, has erased everything. But the police are able to recover, using this end case program, three sets of photographs. And the first set of photographs is in the early afternoon. And it's a group of six photographs, and these photographs are dated June 4th, 2008, and they have times on them, and they have time to the second. And what they're able to see that on June 4th, at 1.42 and 53 seconds, Mr. Alexander was very much alive. Not only was he very much alive, he was involved in these photographs with a woman. And yes, they were both sinning because they were going at it. 
they were nude. And yes, they are engaged in sexual relations in these photographs. Photograph is at 1.42.53 p.m. The police are able to go in there and get that photograph. And this shows a frontal view of a woman. Then there's another photograph at 1.44 p.m. And it shows this woman's back end. And they're nude. They're just taking photographs. At 1.44.50 p.m., there's a photograph of the victim. And clearly, he's excited. But there's also on there a bottle of KY, which is a personal lubricant that's used during sex. And we know that the, it was the defendant who introduced Mr. Alexander to the use of this KY. Well, the other thing is that we also, at 147.15, there's another view of the defendant. And then there are two other photographs that you really can't tell the time, but certainly they are of the defendant. So there's a total of four photographs of the defendant and two of Mr. Alexander. And they're both, both of them, are very much alive. And yes, these are salacious photographs in the sense that what they are doing is what happens behind closed doors. But there is no legal prohibition against her driving or coming over to his house and having sex. There's no prohibition about that. There's no prohibition against Mr. Alexander having sex either. But that's what they find. They find him with a woman having sex on June 4th of 2008. Very much alive. Both of them sinning, if you will. Well, but that still doesn't get you any nearer to solving this crime, because at least you know that he was alive on June 4th. And as they look at those photographs, they're able to make a determination, are able to see that actually the person in that photograph is somebody that people know. And it's an, indivi it's an individual by the name of Jody Arias. But you know, photographs can be a little blurry, they can be a little deceptive. You, you, you kind of want to be sure that that's the person. And so what they do is, on this hallway, and you'll see it as number 77, they were able to find a palm print, left palm print. And that ha is a mixture, it's a DNA mixture, but it's a palm print. And they're able to compare it to the known photograph of Jody Ann Arias, and she's left-handed, and that's her palm print that's on there. So now they have a photograph of what they believe is her, plus they have this palm print, and they've developed a DNA profile from there that matches her DNA profile. Then also in the hallway here at number six, down here toward the bottom, where there's the RP and the six, they find a hair, and they conduct DNA analysis on that hair. And the profile that is developed so into that DNA analysis matches the profile of the defendant. So the police are now sure that the person in those photographs is the defendant, and it's June 4th of 2008. Again, it, it's nice to know that, and they're getting close, and it, it appears, because of all the blood that's there, that she's the person that committed this horrible crime, that committed this horrible killing. This second set of photographs is 20 photographs and they are all of Mr. Alexander. And presumably because she's the one that's in the photograph with him, and they're not out of photographs, in other words, he's not taking them himself, it appears that she's the one that's taken up these photographs of him in the shower, and they're on June 4th, 2008, at 5.22.24. They were engaged in these, these acts at 1.45, but now at, at 5.22.24, He's in the shower, and he's posing for the person who's taking these photographs. And there's many poses of the water running down him, and most of them are from the waist up. So there's no genitalia that are being shown during these photographs. But the 20th photograph shows him sitting in this shower. And you do see the lower right quadrant of his posterior. And that photograph was taken at 5.30.30. So he was in the shower for approximately eight minutes with these photographs being taken. Well, 
That again starts to narrow it down. And then there's finally a third set of photographs. And these are accidental photographs. These are inadvertent photographs. These are photographs that the killer did not want taken. And the first one of those is 44 seconds taken, 44 seconds after the photograph of Mr. Alexander's posterior in the shower. And that's taken at 531.14. I'm sorry, Ed. Yes, that is taken at 531.14. So it's 44 seconds after the last photograph in the shower. And this is, if you will, a photograph of movement. And the reason that I say it's a photograph of movement is because it's taken, or it's consistent with being taken from the waist. The camera is straight up. In other words, it's not upside down, it's not to the side, it's straight up. But the photograph is a picture of the lights above the shower, and it's nothing more than movement. But that's when the attack is happening, and that's when Mr. Alexander is being attacked by this individual. The next inadvertent photograph is at 5.32.16. One minute and two seconds later. And that photograph is taken right here, near that 45. And it's another inadvertent photograph. And this photograph is consistent with the camera being taken off from the shoulder, the lanyard that's around it, and falling. But the camera is actually on the ground now and upside down. So this photograph is upside down. All the other photographs have been right side up, which is consistent with the camera falling here, striking the click, or striking the, 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 sh the, the, the button, and taking a photograph. And you do see the killer in this one. You see, this individual's here. You see her foot. Not only do you see her foot, but you see Mr. Alexander's head, you see his arm, you see him bleeding profusely, you see the area of the sink down here, and you know what else you see? You see her manipulating him, trying to drag him or move him. And we know she moved him because he ends up in the shower. So we do know that he's here for sure. Well, she begins to tug, pull him towards the shower. And there's another photograph that's inadvertently taken a minute and 16 seconds later at 5.33.32. And this photograph, again, is upside down when it's found. So the camera had not been moved, apparently, from the previous photograph. And this one is consistent with somebody stepping on the camera and there being a photo that it's taken. And on this one, what you do see is the shoulder of Mr. Alexander. You see the trim, and it's a little bit further down, this hallway. It's this person that's in court here today. Drags him down in this direction. So the police now know what happened. They know that on June 4th of 2008, starting around in the afternoon, sometime after 1 o'clock. The defendant is there with Mr. Alexander. Even though they've broken up, even though she's in Wairika, somehow she's there in his house in Mesa, Arizona. They know that they engage in what is clearly one of the, the normal things of our species, and that's sexual intercourse. They enjoy themselves. Yes, from a religious perspective, both of them were sinning. but. She's there, and if she's there from Wairika, she took a thousand miles to get to that cinema. Then we know that at 5.30ish, later on, he's in the shower. They know that whatever's going on, his defenses are down, he's very comfortable. We also know then that as he sat there, she took the knife and began to stab him when he was in that defenseless sitting position and began and stuck the knife in his chest. He struggled. He grabbed the knife. And when he grabbed the knife, of course that resulted in more blood. 
But since he's not going to die immediately, he's going to die from the loss of blood, and he hasn't lost consciousness, he began to go around the bathroom and ends up at the sink, hunched over. We know that he receives a lot of stab wounds to the back, and they're grouped and also to his head. We know that he was stationary at that point when he gets to that sink. So we don't know exactly where, but it could be. It's consistent with him then being stabbed at that point as he continues to bleed out. And this bleeding out process is not immediate. He can speak, he can talk, blood may be flowing from his mouth, but he can still make noises, he can still move until he starts to lose strength. We know that, we can say at least, that it's consistent with him then trying to get away and he got as far as here, the entrance to the major part of the bedroom. And we know that because of the photographs that we have. And we also know because of the big blotch of blood that's there. And that's where the slitting ear to ear took place. He was still alive at that point. That's why there's so much blood. Because when you die, the medical examiner will tell you, you can do whatever you want to the body. But if you're already dead, there's not going to be this spurting of blood. There's not going to be this blood that's out there. So he was still alive then. We also know that that is a rapidly mortal wound. And in light of the fact that he was already bleeding, he was more likely than not dead at that point. And by the time she was dragging him down, pulling him down towards this area right here, he didn't need that shot to the head. But. She had a gun somewhere, and she got that gun. We don't know the distance, and part of the reason we don't know the distance is because the body's decomposed, but do know that she put that bullet right in his temple, and that also would have been rapidly fatal. That, that injury would have also rendered him unconscious. So after that, she took that camera at some point, knowing what was on there, and you know how difficult it is to deal with these cameras. She was able to go through the process and deleted all of the photographs. She took time to drag him, put him in the shower, clean him up, doing away with whatever evidence may be on there, clean the area there, even though it's still very bloody, took a towel to clean up, walked downstairs. Remember, he's got this dog Napoleon there walked downstairs, went to the washing machine, stuck everything in the washing machine, and had the wherewithal to start it. And put the camera in there after she deleted all of those photographs. Police knew that that's who she was. But they had something else that they needed to deal with. Because as I told you, this happened on June 4th, which was a Wednesday. The body wasn't discovered until Monday, the 9th of June. On the 10th of June, which is when, since everything happened at night, the investigation really took off on the 10th. Detective Esteban Flores, Steve Flores of the Mesa Police Department, received a telephone call from somebody wanting to help. This person here called him up, wanted to help him out, and started to talk about how their relationship with Travis Alexander, how she was in Wairica, California at this time that this happened, could not have had anything to do with this at all. She, she was asked, well, you know, does Mr. Alexander have any guns? Oh, no, 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 Mr. Alexander has no guns whatsoever. All he could do, to do for him to defend himself, all he, had, all he had was his fist. How about knives? Did he have any knives? Oh, no, 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 no knives. Oh, uh, not Mr. Alexander. He didn't have any of that. Not Travis. So she's telling them he didn't have a gun there so that the killers, whoever they were, according to her, brought him, brought them with, with them. The other thing that she says is that, well, you may want to start looking. She gives them a, gives them a, uh, a, 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 a lead. You may want to start looking at one of his roommates guy by the last name of Brown, Thomas Brown. That's who you really need to look at because, you know, if you're really looking for people, that's, that's the person who you may want to look at because I wasn't there. 
according to her, the last time she was there was in April of 2008. So how could it be her since this happened on June 4th, 2008? So it really couldn't have been her. Well, at that time, of course, the police know. They've seen photographs. They already know they got frame prints there. So they know that that perhaps isn't the truth. Well, they know it isn't the truth. It's not a perhaps proposition. This detective keeps talking to her. And she says, you know, it really wasn't me. I didn't have anything to do with it. And describes this relationship that she had with Mr. Alexander. The police need to do something with that because she has made it a point of saying she wasn't there. I couldn't have possibly been there. And so they start looking further at a possibility of where she was and that sort of thing. And one of the things that they're able to discover is that a week before this killing on June 4th of 2008, on May 28, 2008, there was a burglary report seemingly unrelated to this case. There was a burglary report up in Wairika, California where she was, May 28, 2008. And the burglary, the police responded sometime around 3.30 in the afternoon of May 28th, which was about a week before Mr. Alexander was killed. And they responded to a house on Pine Street, the house where the defendant was living back on May 28th of 2008. And the police did talk to the defendant about it, and there were items that were taken during this burglary. But according to the officer that responded, Kevin Friedman of the Wairika Police Department, well, you know, there was something not right about this burglary. I mean, maybe the entry, there was a little bit of a problem. It was just like they were very careful how they entered. They opened the drawers, but, you know, there were items that clearly were of value that they didn't take. And, well, it just didn't seem quite right. When he went there, there were two people there, the grandparents, but the defendant wasn't there. She was called and showed up and indicated that she had been the last person there and had been there as late as approximately 1 p.m. And the burglary was reported sometime around 3.30. So it happened between 1 and 3.30 p.m. And the defendant reported, oh, yes, yes, there was some items that were taken of mine. Uh, there was a $20 bill and a $10 bill, so there was $30 that were taken of mine. And, you know, luckily for me, before I left, I was able to hide my laptop underneath some dirty clothing. So just in case somebody came in and, you know, wanted to steal stuff, they didn't take my laptop. And thank God I did that because they didn't take my laptop. Well, those were some of the things that were taken and some of the things that were taken. But one of the things that was taken was a 25 caliber handgun belonging to the grandfather. And this is just a week before the killing. This, and it matched in the sense that it's the same caliber, the 25 caliber casing that is labeled number one and is found by the sink. Well, the police looked at that and knew that there was a time, it was very close in time. The other thing that police were able to find was that on that same day, May 28th of 2008, at 9.25 p.m., the defendant sent an email. And she sent an email to Travis Alexander. And she mentions that he's going to Cancun. That's the first mention there is in any of their correspondence, whether it be text messaging, whether it be emails or instant messaging, of Cancun. She indicates that she knows that he's going to Cancun. It is clear now that he's going to Cancun and she ain't going with him. So that's something that they have. The other thing that they start looking around and they're able to find is that the defendant on June 2nd, which is two days before the killing, actually went from Wairika, California to Redding, California, which is maybe one to two hours away, south. And she went south for the purpose of renting a car. They have car rental agencies in Wairika, but she actually went to a different town that's approximately 90 miles away. And she went to a budget rental car, and uh, she spoke to uh, the agent there. And one of the things that uh, she was able to do is rent a car. But again, it was not in her town, and it was in a place that's far away. 
and the person who rented the car to her, well, he was shown a photographic lineup. And he said, and asked whether or not he saw the person that he rented the car to. He said, oh yeah, there she is, right there, the defendant. He said, but, you know, the photograph that you're showing me, she's got black hair. When she came to rent the car for me, she, had, she was a barn. So, um, you know, it's the same girl, I'm sure of that. But her hair color changed. Her hair color changed from June 2nd to June 4th in the afternoon when she was having sex with Mr. Alexander. So we know that from the photograph. And she rented the car and said she was going to return it on June 6th of 2008. And in fact, she returned it on June 7th of 2008. And there was over 2,000 miles in that car. One of the other things that police were able to do is that they were able to find receipts. And they were able to show that the defendant, in fact, and she readily admits this now, that she did take a trip. She took a trip, but she was going to go to Utah, according to her. She was going to go to Utah because she has a love interest there, or somebody that could potentially be a love interest, by the name of Ryan Burns. And she was going to visit him, not only visit him, but she was also going there to maybe do some marketing with PPL on this Thursday afternoon, which would have been the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, sixth, fifth of uh, June. And so they're able to see that she goes to Southern California, she stops at places like Starbucks there in the evening, sometime around 9 o'clock in the evening, and giving her plenty of time for, to be there the next day. So they're able to see that not only does she have the opportunity, she actually is placed near the area of California, which would have been a short, short in, is a relative term, drive to Mesa. So when she says to the police back on June 10th of 2008 that she did, hadn't been there, well, the police knew now that that was not true because they could trace her movements. Well, the other thing that they were able to find that came out is that... Mr. Marshall, we're going to take the news at this time. Okay, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be back in the designated area at 1.30. Please remember the admonition. I'm going to ask that you review the admonition. It is in your black binder. You should have it in writing. We left off before lunch talking about the police investigation into the defendant's statement that she was not at uh, Mr. Alexander's home on June 4th of 2008, and specifically we were talking about the police obtaining documents that took, showed that she um, rented a car in Redding, California on June 2nd, and that they were able to show that she actually made her way down south in California, and made her way down to Southern California, and at some point made her way over to um, Utah. And ostensibly, she indicated that she was going to Utah to meet up with a friend, somebody that she um, had a romantic interest in, somebody by the name of Ryan Burns. And what Mr. Burns will tell you is that she was supposed to arrive a day earlier. And somehow, for this whole period of time, he couldn't get a hold of her. He tried to call her, she wouldn't call him back. We know now that the reason that, that was is because she was with Mr. Alexander. But she did happen to arrive in the Salt Lake City, Utah uh, area on June 5th, which was, I'm sorry, yeah, June 5th, which was that Thursday. And as she got there sometime around a little bit before 11 o'clock, Mr. Burns indicated that he had to go to a meeting and that if she wanted to go with him, that she could follow him in her car, the car, the rental car that she was driving. As they were driving in West Jordan, Utah, an officer with the Jordan, West Jordan Police Department stopped her in that vehicle. And the reason they stopped her in that car was because there was a problem with her license plate. Uh, there are two plates that are required in Utah, and in fact, there are two plates that are provided and required in California. So when the car was rented, there was a front plate and there was also a back plate. Well, the plate, the car that she was driving did not have a front plate. So between the time that she rented it and the time that she was stopped, somebody took that plate off. Additionally, the reason that she was stopped is that the plate in the back had been turned upside down. 
And so the police officer stopped her or stopped the car, and he will come in. His name's Michael Gallietti, and he will tell you that the person that was driving the car was the defendant. And she provided some story about being at Starbucks, at Starbucks and that somehow some of the kids were trying to play a trick and took the license plate off the car and put one of the license plates inside the car and then somehow <coughs> turned the other license plate upside down. Well, she continues on with Mr. Burns and then at some point the meeting is over, they go back to his uh, place and what seems to be something with her is that the inevitable happens. They do begin to become engaged amorously. They begin to kiss. They begin to get involved in that sort of fashion. And Mr. Burns will tell you that, yes, they did go further than that. And in fact, he will say that he had his hands between her legs. And he will also say that the reason that they didn't go all the way or continue on to sexual intercourse is because he's Mormon. And he, his teachings, which I've been telling you about, do not allow for that sort of behavior, if you will. And so it wasn't the, that the defendant was stopping him, it was that he decided not to go any further than that. And then the police also determined that the car was finally returned on the 7th of June back to the uh, budget rental car in Redding, California. Well, the police, now knowing that <clears throat> there was this trip that was planned, they have the photograph. They now have the DNA, and they also have the fingerprints, arrested the defendant for the first degree murder of Travis Alexander. And as part of that process of the arrest, the police conducted or spoke with the defendant. And of course, prior to speaking with the defendant, they admonished her of the Miranda warnings and talked to her about what the Miranda warnings were, and she agreed to speak with them, and these are videotaped. And this was on June 15th of 2008. And they arrested her while she was in this home on Pine Street, the home that she lived there with her grandparents, the home where there was this burglary on May 28th of 2008. And when they spoke with her on that June 15th, the defendant said, well, you know, you know, I'll talk to you about it, but I don't, other than what I've already told you, I don't know too much about it. Well, why don't you tell us what you do now? Well, I can tell you that the last time that I was there was back in April of 2008. That's what she told me. And they said, well, are you sure? I mean, we have some photographs of you there. Oh, are, she said, well, are you sure they weren't taken on a different date? No, we're sure they weren't taken on a different date. Well, I wasn't there. It wasn't me. Well, what about this time lapse? What about this gap where you sort of disappear. You're supposed to be in Utah with this boy, other boyfriend of yours, and yet you're, 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 you can't be found. People are making calls. There are no calls going out, nothing going in. What about that time? I got lost. What ended up happening is that I ended up getting lost, and I got so lost I almost can't tell you where I was. But I do know one thing, she said. I ended up on the 40, the I-40. And the detective said to her, how can that be possible? If you're coming from California and you're going to Salt Lake City, Utah, how is it possible since the road goes northeast, the 15 goes northeast and takes you through Las Vegas that way, why the only way that you can get on the 40 is if you come through Mesa and then you come up that way? Couldn't have been on the 40. There's no way that you could have. Oh, yes, I was, she said. You know, I can get lost with the best of them. I slept in my car. And my, and my phone, the reason no one was able to get a hold of me was that it wasn't charged up. It has lost its charge. The police kept saying, but that doesn't make any sense. Why would you say that that's what happened? And if you're going to Salt Lake City, how can you say that you actually came through the 40 and then up through Las Vegas that way? She kept to her story and said, no, I was never there on June 4th, 2008. Well, so the police left it at that. The next day she indicated a willingness to continue talking to the police officers, and that was July 16th. And uh, she was again read her Miranda warnings. And this time, when she spoke to the police officer, she said, you know, I gotta tell you something. I really have to tell you something. Um, maybe what I told you yesterday, well, Maybe that's not the truth. 
What I really have to tell you today is, is, is what happened. And what ended up happening is, and I'm just incredibly scared for my family. I'm just totally scared for my brother, my sister, my family, my grandparents, because as a result of this killing, well, the people that really did this killing, they're the ones, these are the people that, that are out to get my parents. So, although I told you yesterday that I wasn't there, well, I'm telling you now that I was there. And I can tell you what happened. I arrived there sometime around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning of June 4th. When I arrived there, Travis was on the computer, and he was watching some sort of YouTube thing about some ladies with something on their head, and it was just a silly video, and we sat and watched it for a little bit. And after watching that for a short period of time, well, we went up to bed. Nothing happened. The next day, in the afternoon, you're right. That is me in those photographs. That's me, and yes, we are engaged. Intimacies. We're having sex. The other thing that's also true is that, well, those photographs, 20 that I talked to you about, I was the one that was the photographer. I was the one that was taking those photographs. I was the one that talked him into standing and posing for me. He really didn't want to pose for me. He thought it was just not his cup of tea. But, you know, he sort of did it for me. And so I began to take the photographs of him. As I'm taking these photographs of him, I hear this loud noise. And something hits me. And I really can't, I don't know if, I think I went unconscious. I'm not sure I went unconscious, but I think I did. And then I realize that Travis is hurt. I don't know how it happened, but I realize that Travis is hurt. And he's on all fours. And he's saying, help me, help me, or words to that effect. He can't get up. And I'm trying to help him. I'm trying to do the best I can to get him out of there, to get him up so we can leave. That's what I'm doing. She says, I'm trying to do the best that I can. But he can't seem to get up because there's a problem with his legs. He says he can't move. Well, while I'm trying to do this, I realized that, and again, I didn't tell you yesterday, yesterday because I was afraid. But what is going on is that there's these two individuals. First, she really doesn't know what their sexes are, but comes around and says, it's a man and it's a woman. Not only is it a man and a woman, but all I can see are their eyes. I can tell you, I guess, she said that they're Caucasian. Or maybe she can tell you that. But other than that, I don't have any way of identifying who these attackers are. And according to them, it appears that I surprised them, that I shouldn't have been there. Because one of them said words to the effect that, you know, that's that girl from California. I wasn't supposed to be there, that these people were designed to take care of Travis for whatever reason they had. And I don't know what that reason is. They were there to do him uh, harm. Well, did, what kind of weapons did they have? Well, she said, I think they had one or two guns. I'm really not sure. All I know is that I was focused on Travis. I had been hit myself. I, I, I didn't know what to do. And so what happened then? Well, Travis kept saying to go to the neighbors for help, but I, I didn't want to leave him there. And at one point, what I did was that I was able to, and it depends on what, part of, what point the story is picked up, but I pushed the girl who was there, and I was able to get the better her, and I was about to run out, get out and go get some help, except that I was then confronted by the guy. And the girl kept saying, well, just do her, just do her, and the guy didn't want to do it. But I had the gun straight at my face. And this gun that was pointed at my face, well, he pulled the trigger. And for whatever reason, providence perhaps, gun didn't go off. But I was very worried still about Travis, and I needed to to, to get him out of there. When the gun didn't go off, well, this guy started looking through my purse. And lo and behold, in my purse, believe it or not, I happen to have my car registration that shows my address, because that's what I carry around. So they knew, they being the, this, this guy, knew exactly where I lived. And he said to me, well, if you tell what happened here, 
the same thing's going to happen to your family. So she then told the detective, how could you expect me to say anything? At some point, she also indicates that she is fighting with the woman. She claims that she's barefoot, and that the woman um, may have hit her feet, but she was able to hit the woman also. The detective asked, well, what about a knife? What, did, did a knife ever come up? She said, I think the woman was the one that had the knife. And when you were going through all these things, and she says everything happened in the bathroom, when you were going through all these things, what was Travis doing? What was going on with Travis? Well, he was alive. It looks like he was really in a lot of pain. But I could, there wasn't anything I could do because he couldn't get up. I tried. I did the best that I could. I fought with the girl. I had the gun pointed at me. I mean, they already knew where I lived. Just by looking at it, they knew my address, and they, I guess, had committed to memory. So I was worried about my family. So there was nothing I could do. So what happened next? Well, I was able to pick up my purse. And the police did not find any articles of clothing there from her. I was able, she said, to pick up my, my uh, purse run out of the house, run downstairs, and nobody chased me. And then I was able to get in the car, and I was able to drive away and make my getaway. Why didn't you call the police, she was asked. Well, don't you know? My phone wasn't charged up. That's why I couldn't, couldn't dial. That's what the problem was. Never called the police from there all the way to Utah. There never was a call. The only call came from Murray Hall on June 9th. That's the, her version. And after that version, the defendant seemed to want an audience. And she began to go on national television to talk about it. And basically, that was her story, that there had been two other individuals that had done it. And in fact, she went on a show called Inside Edition, which will be exhibit number 247, and she talked to them about this. I understand that everything, all of the evidence against me right now is very compelling. What really happened in there? In a nutshell, two people took Travis's life, two monsters. You did not shoot Travis. No, I've never even shot a real gun. You did not stab him 27 I've never, times. Ne that's, that's heinous. Or I've never. slit his throat from ear to ear. I can't imagine slitting anyone's throat. That was her story that, in part, that's a summary of the story that she told the detective. Well, there's a different story now. Now, it's not that she wasn't there. Now, it's not that it's two people with whatever variation she may have provided to these national shows. Now, she admits it. It was her. She's the person who actually did this. And she's the person that actually did, even though she says otherwise, she's the one that did the stabbing. She's the one that slit his throat, and she's the one that shot him. She's the one that now is admitting that after telling all these things. And even though she says that, she still has a view as to the evidence. And this is exhibit number 248. No jury is going to convict me. Why not? Because I'm innocent, and you can mark my words on that one. No jury will convict me. I also ask that you mark her words, that her words that no jury will convict her, even though she has admitted that she's the person that did this after giving many or different stories of what happened. And as you mark her words, I ask you, while you're doing that, in your final deliberations, that you remember that while you're marking the guilty verdict for her premeditated killing of Travis Alexander. Thank you.